Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Shall we just begin our new section? So I'm very much honored to be the moderator for this section. I'm Dr. Zhang from Raging Hospital. And uh, in the next two hours, we will just welcome four distinguished professors to share their great expectations uh, about the uh, new technologies for tumor screening, diagnosis, and treatment. And so the first professor is Professor Jing Zhang, Chief Physician of the Department of Oncology, Professor of Oncology, Shanghai Raging Hospital, Shanghai Institute of Digestive Surgery. And he is a well-known expert in oncology, and he has achieved a lot uh, in the translation research of chemotherapy and target therapy for gastric cancer and colorectal cancer, and mainly in the biomarkers research and, uh, and metamomic chemotherapy. He um, just finished three uh, National Science Foundation grants and uh, a lot of just funds. And also he is serving as a faculty in several international and domestic academic associations including Chinese Medical Association, et cetera. So um, his title today is Screaming Gastric Cancer Using Oral Contrast Enhanced Transabdominal Ultrasonography uh, in Chinese Rural Asymptomatic Individuals, Preliminary Results of Unicorn Study. Let's welcome. Uh, thank you, Professor Zhang for her very onerous uh, introduction. And uh, I'm Dr. Jin from the Department of the Oncology of Region Hospital. And I <clears throat> mainly focus on the GI cancer research. And uh, it's of my great honor to be invited by the organizer and uh, shared with you the preliminary results of our uh, screening study. We call it a unicorn study. And this study is mainly focused on to develop uh, an optional tool to screening the early gastric cancer, as well as the gastric cancer patients in Greater Shanghai. This is our preliminary results. So first, I'd like to introduce our department. So the Department of the Oncology is a newly established department in our one century, one century years uh, history region hospital. So currently, we have many uh, wards. The main two wards is located in the many campus, and we mainly focus on our clinical research and the translational research. Also, we have established our satellite branches in the north part of Greater Shanghai, we call the Jardin District, and is incorporated with the established or newly established proton therapeutic protocol as well as we have our satellite hospitals in Zhejiang province, as well as in Jiangsu province. So currently we have established the Region Cancer Alliance which composed around the 30 hospitals located in the, the near provinces near Shanghai. So I think this is a relatively good platform to, uh, to performing our clinical research as well as our epidemiological uh, research in the uh, solid tumors. So we have established for near uh, eight years. So within the past eight years, we have established, try to construct three major systems in the field, as well as in the clinical and the basic research of cancer. The first is the tumor evaluation system which means that how we can understanding a tumor. This is the collaboration with the Department of the Radiology, Pathology, as well as our Institute. So today's moderator, Professor Zhang Huan, is our major collaborator, major focus on the morphological changes and patterns of the solid tumor. Uh, we also can focus on the, not only the tumor itself, but also on the microenvironments. The second system we established is the precision decision system. 
So we have accumulation clinical evidence to establish our own clinical guideline for our clinical decision. Meanwhile, we have also established a system based upon the NGS system for our precision clinical decision based upon the molecular alterations. So in the field of the gastric cancer and the colorectal cancer, we have mainly established a system based upon our molecular alterations to guiding us a precision clinical decision. The third is the efficacy evaluation system. We have using the radiology, functional radiological, as well as our pathology for the efficacy evaluation for different kinds of the anti-cancer agents beyond the traditional cytotoxic agents. We have established system to evaluate efficacy for the angiogenic, anti-angiogenic agents as well as our immuno checkpoint inhibitors. So these are three major systems we have been focused and try to establish this system, not only based upon the region hospital, but also based upon the region cancer care alliance. So first I'd like to introduce the unicorn study. We have launched a focus for 10 years in the rural area of greater Shanghai. Uh, this is the epidemiological data of the major uh, uh, malignancies in mainland of China. So we have seen that the most of it is in GI, in GI tract, as well as in the pancreatal biliary tract. So we have seen that the, most, the top 10 malignancies in greater Shanghai in the past 40 years. Very interestingly, that we're finding that in the around 40 years ago, the stomach cancer ranks the number one in the leading malignancies in Greater Shanghai. But its ranks had declined day after day, and there's a slightly declining in the incidence. And currently, it ranks the number four in the top 10 malignancies in Greater Shanghai. This is the stomach cancer. We also noticed that the colorectal cancer, as well as the breast cancer and the pancreatic cancer, is progressively increased. This is a very interesting trend in the incidence of the leading malignancies in Greater Shanghai and one of the developed city in China. So we have noticed that what is the major reasons for the uh, slightly declining in the incidence of the stomach cancer. And the first is that we have widely used the refrigerator. The second is the recognition of the helicobacter pylori because this is a China is a developing country and this is a huge area and a very high population. This is relatively difficult to carry out a population based screening by using the endoscopy. So this is a quite a difficult challenge to establish an optional tool for the screening of the stomach cancer, as well as the other GI malignancies in our population. So this is a task and the most important task for us. So serving as in uh, the Department of Oncology of a tertiary hospital, uh, such as region hospital, we, are not have the in we not only have the interest to dealing with the patient with the very far advanced stage, but also this is our responsibility to, uh, to take the, the social responsibility for cancer screening. So this is the, um, the data published by the, the Sun Yat-sen uh, University two years ago, uh, Professor Xu Ruihua leading this team and established an AI system. He called it system is the GI artificial intelligence diagnosis system, which means based upon the, the, the several thousand of the imagination, they developed this system to guide the endoscopist for, for their clinical decision. So we might see that the different cohort. The left one is the very experienced expert, which the blue boxes means that that the missed diagnosed by the endoscopy, but is corrected and identified by gray system. 
we might see that in the, the right column, this is the trainee and the younger ex, uh, the endoscopist, that we might see that the blue one is, is indicated that is the missed by both the endoscopic and AI, yet the green one is the misdiagnosed by the endoscopist, but is identified by this system. This is a sharp difference which and I identify the role and the characteristics of this system to helping the endoscopist in their clinical decision, especially in the screening of the early gastric cancer in their clinical practice. This is the work published two years ago in the Lansington College. It's leading uh, by Professor Xu Ruihua in Shen Yixin University. Also, we have developed this item, we call it cancer geography. This is the map of Greater Shanghai in the downstream of Yangtze River. We might see that the different color indicates the different incidence of the gastric cancer in different districts. We might see that in the just near the downstream of Yangtze River, there's a two island. The one is the, we call it the, the Chongming Island. The other we call the Changxing Island. These two islands, we have noticed a relatively higher incidence of the gastric cancer compared with the other district of Greater Shanghai. So we have developed this study, we call it oral contrast enhanced transabdominal ultrasonography based multidimensional gastric cancer screening system in Chinese rural areas. We call the Unicom study, which means that we try to explore a system for the early gastric cancer screening as well as the gastric cancer screening in this population, in this higher gastric cancer incidence area, as well as we try to establish an, a big cohort for the chronic disease management. We not only have the interest in the gastric cancer, this is the first step. The later we will focus on the other most common malignancies in Shanghai, for example, the, the liver cancer, as well as the colorectal cancer, uh, and also beyond the, the, the solid tumor, we also can manage and follow up the chronic diseases. For example, the hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. So we call it this, this phenomenon is the cancer geography, which means that the, the different kinds of the cancer types also have the dis, a distinct, a distinctive geographic distribution. So we might quickly uh, review the characteristics and the ultrasonography by transabdominal technique. For this even less invasive technique, we're using the transabdominal ultrasonography. We might see that the different kinds of the, the, the lesions, for example, the cancer, the gist, the polyps, the ulcer, et cetera, the different lesion types with their different characteristics. Also, we're using the oral intake contrast of it, which is based uh, from the cereals. This is the organic, we do not have the chemical compound. We use the cereal based oral contrast for our very clear imagination by using the transabdominal ultrasonography. So we might see that the four uh, layers of the gastric wall structure. And uh, by using the oral intake uh, contrast, we might see very clearly the different layers of this, the stomach wall. And also we have compared the imagination by using the ultrasonography with that of the endoscopy. This is a typical imagination of the gastric cancer patients we might see the lesions by endoscopy compared with that in the ultrasonography. That's that we have a, 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 a similar uh, sensitivity and the specificity. So up to now, we have using the almost 10 years and screening for about the, the 20,000, 23,000 uh, populations in these three islands, among which the compliance of it is, is approaching the 70%. Uh, 
And also among those with uh, receiving the transabdominal ultrasonography, we have finding near 200 cases with the positive finding, which not only find the cancer, but also we have the ulcers, we have the polyps, we have the justice sector. Also, we have finding the lesions in the liver. So we have uh, recommended these uh, populations with positive finding for further gastroscopy. And the, all these, uh, these populations with positive findings underwent the gastroscopy and the finding the 16 patients with the gastric cancer. And among which nine of them is the early stage. So we does not comparing this technique or this tool with that of the gastroscopy because we are lacking of the financial support to carrying this population based screening. So we use the ultrasonography for the gastric cancer screening as a less invasive, it's very economic, and also it's very optional for old population because most of the gastric cancer patients at the onset of the disease at the age of beyond the 16. So in the older populations, there's the less tolerate for the endoscopy. So among which this technique might provide, provide an optional tool for the rural area. And our further work is try to establish an AI-based system with the hand-derived devices for the further service for the population screening. Also, along with the auto, uh, auto mm, the, the sonography, we have correct the, the behavior uh, characteristics of all the populations. They have finished the questionnaire. We have in detail the questionnaire based upon the, how many uh, the source your family consumed the last month, and do you have the habit to intake the preserved uh, the vegetables, as well as the family history of these individuals. Also, this is a very uh, preliminary work. I know that only uh, 20,000 cases is far less than that of the epidemiological correction data. So in the future, we are also expanding our data correction and also try to explore an AI-based facilities for this gastric cancer screening system. So um, this is our, uh, this is my last uh, uh, slide. And also the Unicom, the preliminary Unicom study also indicates that the auto contrast enhanced transabdominal ultrasonography is an, an optional, optional tool for the rural area for the, the gastric cancer screening. And we do not compare with that of the gastroscopy, but also we try to explore and try to establish its precise uh, role in the, uh, in the screening system of the gastric cancer. So we have finding that the reported incidence of the gastric cancer in mainland of China is nearing near 30 uh, per 100,000 cases. But in Shanghai, it's relatively higher than that of the Great China. And also the Chongming CDC have reported near over uh, 50 cases every 100,000 population. So based upon our preliminary data, we have found that incidence of our screened population, the incidence is over 100 every 100,000 populations. So this is uh, indicating that we have the, also the, the spaces for further uh, the develop our devices as well as accumulation our data for the, this uh, techniques as an optional methodology in the gastric cancer screening in this developing country. So uh, this is the time. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Zhang. And
Actually, Professor Zhang has told us about what's going on with the gastric cancer and also what his team has been doing with gastric cancer. And the most important thing is that he recommends us a new but feasible technique. That means the oral, uh, oral contrast enhanced transabdominal ultrasonography to just detect the early gastric cancer. And it's really... Um, important. And actually, he has got his preliminary results, and the results are exciting. So it's just wonderful. So uh, we actually have a part for the discussion. So shall we just leave all the questions to that part? Okay, thanks again. Thank you. And next presenter is Dr. Aurelion Dupré. And the Center Leon Bird and the Insum and Unit Lab Tour. And he is the consult in surgical oncology in the Comprehensive Cancer Center of Leon since uh, 2018, uh, 2013. And his clinical specialty is hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgery, mainly invasive surgery. And his research specialty is translational research and clinical research. And also the, um, he is the principal investigator in a multi-center phase one, two, two study about intraoperative high flow ablation of locally advanced pancreatic cancer. And his topic today is intraoperative high intensive focus ultrasonic ultrasound pancreatic ablation in a porcine model. The first step towards a clinical treatment of locally advanced pancreatic cancer. Let's welcome. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for your kind presentation and thank you for the invitation. So let's begin. So as you know, pancreatic cancer is the major health problem. We have uh, impressive uh, incidence that is rising over the year. For example, in France, we had 5,000 cases per year uh, in 2005. And recently we observed 14,000 cases per year. So it corresponds to an increase in two 150% over the last 15 years. It is currently the fourth leading cause of cancer death, and we estimate that that will be the second uh, cause of cancer death in the next 20 years. The prognosis is very poor with a five-year overall survival of about 6%. And unfortunately, only 20% of the patients are uh, candidates to surgery, which is a only potentially curative treatment. And among those 20% of patients, less than 20% of those patients will cure from their pancreatic cancer. So it is clear that we need new treatments in, in our toolbox. Focal destruction techniques are very well known and they are used uh, instead of surgery in some patients. The technique is based on thermal ablation of tissues. The main representative of focal destruction techniques are radiofrequency ablations, microwave ablations, and uh, they are not frequently used in pancreatic cancer. The focal destruction techniques have some limits. It requires the introduction of a probe into the tumor. It is uh, subjected to the heat sink effect. That is, when you increase the, the temperature in tissue, when it is close to large vessels, you have a decrease in temperature. So you have a risk of under treatment of the tumor when it's close to uh, large vessels. And the rise in, uh, in temperature is very high. 
more than 160 degrees, for example, with micro evaporation. So you can't have a, a pair procedural monitoring. There are some new, not very new, but recent ablative techniques to uh, encounter the, those uh, limits. Uh, for example, you have irreversible electroporation and high intensity focus ultrasound or high few. So what is high few? Uh, high few is um, a technique of uh, focusing the ultrasound. You all know the, the ultrasound for diagnosis purpose. High flu is therapeutic ultrasound. It's, the principle is, is pretty is simple. It's like when you put a magnifier glass to focus the sun rays to obtain fire. You, it's the same principle with ultrasound. You have a focal transducer which focuses the, the ultrasound. And at the focal point, you have an increase in uh, the temperature to 70 to 80 degrees in a few seconds, and it results in coagulative necrosis. The main advantage of IFU is it's a totally non-invasive technique, and there are some theoretical advantages. Uh, the phenomenon is, is very fast, so it, it looks like it's uh, independent from the blood flow. And as the temperature rise uh, very, very fast and not, not too high, you can have the possibility of real-time monitoring of therapeutic effects. But it's not a magical technique. Of course, you have some technical difficulties. The, um, here you have an example of the um, IFU device that is used in, uh, in China. It's an extracorporeal device. And the, um, the elementary ablation obtained with IFU is, is the size of a rice grain. So if you want to ablate a large, uh, a large tumor, you have to juxtapose the, the rice grain to obtain a, a large ablation. So it requires a long lasting uh, treatment. For example, for the treatment of prostate, uh, you need um, more than one hour. And for the treatment of uh, uterus uh, fibroma, you need several hours. So it's clearly limiting the development of the technique. Some other difficulties are specific to the pancreas. The, this organ is very deep seated, so you have um, difficulties to target, to visualize the, the organ because you have interposition of the, gas, of the stomach and the, the colon. So you have bowel and gas interposition, which is not very good uh, for your ultrasound. And the other difficulty with the pancreas is the, the parenchyma, parenchyma of the pancreas that is very fragile and you have a risk of uh, pancreatitis. So the, the strategy of our lab research was to, to, develop, uh, to develop an intraoperative IFU device which will be able to perform large ablation. So you have in the center here the, the IFU probe that can be held with your hand. And here you have the probe. In the center of the probe, you have a ultrasound probe that is uh, for um, targeting, for ultrasound imaging. And all around the US probe, you have the IFU emitters. With extracorporeal device, the conventional transducer are spherical and you obtain the ablation of the uh, rice grain size. Uh, with our technology, we developed a toroidal transducer and we were able to perform ablation of seven cubic centimeters in 40 seconds and uh, 50 cubic centimeters in six minutes in in vitro study. We developed this device initially for the treatment of liver tumors, just because the history of my department was the treatment of uh, colorectal cancer 
with liver metastasis. So um, about 10 years ago, we developed this device and the, the use is very, very simple. You have the, the probe in your head, you put it on the surface of the liver and you have on the interface, this image you have here, that is black, it's a coupling liquid. It's a balloon fulfilled with water uh, to facilitate the, the, the ultrasound beams. You have here the liver in gray and you have the targets that represents the future area that will be destroyed, that would be ablated by IFU. So if you want to treat a tumor, you just have to put the tumor into the target. We designed a prospective study several years ago in which 30 patients were included. Um, the, the aim of the study was to ablate colorectal liver metastasis before liver resection. There was no modification of the surgical planning because uh, when you treat well patients, there's um, a great chance of cure. So we did not want to risk um, a loss of chance for the patient. And in this study, we had some encouraging results. We were able to perform large ablations in six minutes, and um, we were able to monitor the real-time effect. For example, here on the top right of the slide, a slide you have uh, like triangle-shaped uh, elementary ablation uh, that we initially obtain in 40 seconds. And what is interesting is that with the real-time monitoring, it's very easy to juxtapose um, several ablation and you have an example of um, juxtaposition of two ablation of six minutes and you have a very, very large ablation. The other observation that was interesting was that IV ablation uh, was not uh, subjected to a uh, heat sink effect. Uh, for example, you have here an ablation all around a uh, hepatic vein, and you can see that the ablation is not modified. It's not shrinked by the blood flow. So we have clearly, uh, not demonstrated, but encouraging results um, with no heat sink effect with high food therapy. And our hypothesis was uh, that this particularity would be great in the treatment of pancreatic cancer because we ha you have a lot of uh, big blood vessels all around the, the pancreas. Of course, you can ask what is the rationale for HIFU in pancreatic cancer, because as I told you, it's an aggressive disease. And most of the time, it's a systemic disease with metastatic. What has been demonstrated is uh, in Chinese uh, studies is that HIFU is very effective for pain control. And in some, uh, report of Chinese teams, uh, they also observed a tumor volume reduction. Uh, they observed um, a reduction of one third of the tumor volume at three months and two thirds at six months. So that's very interesting. But we keep in mind that uh, radiotherapy had the same objective several years ago and for local control, but only negative randomized control trial have been published with radiotherapy. Anyway, there is some opportunities because there are a few alternatives. Um, some teams, one team in the US uh, use uh, IRE and one team in Italy use radio frequency ablation, but uh, there's a subpopulation of patients uh, with locally advanced pancreatic cancer in which high food could be, could be useful. Locally advanced pancreatic cancer are not non-metastatic tumors, but not resectable due to vascular involvement, mainly the superior mesenteric artery and the celiac trunk. You have here an example of a quite small tumor, but not very well placed. And if it it involves the superior mesenteric 
artery, you can't resect it. So we made the hypothesis that using intraoperative IFU, we could destroy uh, this kind of tumor. Here you have an example of, um, of the pancreas in human and the CT scan slide corresponding. You have here the pancreas and here the portal vein, here the mesenteric, super mesenteric artery. Of course, we chose the pig as an animal model because the anatomy is quite similar to human uh, as for proportion. And at the bottom and right of the slide, you have a CT scan slide. It looks similar uh, as in human. You have the pancreas here. It's thinner than in human, but anyway. And you have here the portal vein and here, the mesenteric artery. So it's very, very, it looks like a uh, human. The first step was to prove that we were able to do uh, reproducible ablation and safe ablation in the pancreas. And we were afraid of having severe pancreatitis. And we obtained uh, in the preliminary experiments in pigs, um, ablation of two by two centimeters without severe pancreatitis. That was the first step in your in our um, in our pathway research pathway. The second step was to perform the ablation all around the mesenteric vessels. Um, there's no tumor model in pig, but we were confident that if we were able to destroy the pancreas all around the super mesenteric vessel, that would be interesting for human. So we were able to perform ablations of 25 by 35 millimeters in 10 minutes. Here you have a CT scan imaging in a, in a pig. You have here the ablation of the pancreas, and you can see that it encompassed the, the mesenteric vessel. Here you have the, um, the macroscopic view. You have the artery here, and you can see that the ablation is made all around this tissue. So that is very interesting. Of course, I show you the best picture I have, or quite, quite the best, but it took uh, several years to obtain these results because at the beginning, we, we thought that uh, high energy delivering was a good option, but uh, it was not the, the better option because when we use energy deposition over 40 k, k kilojoules, we had some arterial um, complication, such as arterial thrombosis that is not possible if we want to translate these results into human. But when using energy below 40 kilojoules, we never had arterial, arterial thrombosis. We sometimes had arterial spasm uh, when, we, when we did several ablation at the same, uh, at the same spot. To increase the safety before a clinical trial, we developed uh, a real-time Doppler monitoring. Here you have an example of the pancreas that is here. You have the target in red that will be ablated by IFU. And we had a real-time Doppler monitoring to the interface. And it looks obvious to us to have Doppler with uh, ultrasound imaging, but it has never been used uh, in a clinical practice uh, with IFU uh, currently. So it was a, a good start for us. And we were able to visualize the blood flow during the IFU procedure, procedure. And we developed an algorithm that is able to predict the occurrence of an arterial spasm one minute before its occurrence. So it's uh, a safety element that is very important for us uh, before uh, using this technology in human. So in summary, 
at the macroscopic scale, we are able to perform ablation in the pancreas around major peripancreatic vessels. It is reproducible, it is safe. We are able to perform a Doppler monitoring while we destroy uh, pancreatic tissue with IFU. And what is for me very interesting is that we have the confirmation of tissue destruction all around the artery. We have destruction of the, the tissue, the plexus nerves in contact with the artery. So there are no heat sink effect. And it's obviously very interesting in, in a locally advanced pancreatic cancer. So to conclude, it is a good example of translational research. We are able to do IFU pancreatic ablation with an intraoperative approach. Uh, these ablations are reproducible, they are safe, and we design and obtain a, a grant for a phase one, two clinical study, study for the treatment of locally advanced pancreatic cancer. And I hope this study will begin in September, 2022. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Dupree has just uh, told us a story about what is the HIFU and how does it work. So it's really very interesting. And actually, um, I know the HIFU is very safe and very effective because it has no heat sink compared with other, um, other techniques. So uh, the pancreatic uh, tumor is a life limiting tumor. So with the rising incidence, so it is, it is more, it has been uh, paid more and more attention. And actually the high food just can mm, make the mass reduction. And also at the same time, he can, uh, it can just uh, uh, relieve the tumor related complications. So it's really interesting. And in a word, it is an exciting and innovative technique. Okay, actually, uh, <laughs> as far as I know, just uh, if we can do a pancreatic tumor model, uh, animal model in situ, actually it is very difficult, is it? Yeah, so um, would you like to say something about it? Yeah, um, uh, actually it's very difficult to have um, tumor model, especially in the pig. Uh, retry to develop uh, tumor in the pig because for surgical experiments, the pig is a, a very, very good model because the anatomy with pig of 20, 25 kilogram, you have quite the same anatomy for the liver, for the pancreas, but the, the main drawback of this animal model is that you don't have any tumor model. And uh, as, you, as you see, our probe is very, it's quite very big uh, because you hold it in your hand. So you have tumor model in, uh, in, in mice, but uh, it's, it's too small for our uh, intraoperative uh, IFU probe. <laughs> <laughs> so it's tricky. <laughs> and any other questions from uh, other professors? Questions or comments? No. No. Okay. Uh, shall we just uh, leave 10 minutes for a short break? And actually, uh, Professor Chen is now busy with his emergency event. So shall we wait him for 10 minutes? And we were back. OK, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, I have some question. Maybe not question. It's some uh, th um, thinking uh, okay. of the high fall procedure. Can I ask some questions to Dr. The yeah. uh, uh Nice to meet you. Uh, uh, let me uh, introduce myself first, and I'm a surgeon working in Shanghai Region Hospital, but actually now I'm in a 
exchange program doing my PhD in CSCL. I think uh, you are you you know this because we are working in the same campus. Uh, com uh, uh, sorry, uh, same campus, and and now uh, sitting in my office in Chennai. So we are very close, and it's very interesting for the high few uh, procedure. As you mentioned, that you don't have a tumor model in uh, pigs, and uh, and as far as I can understand it, as uh, if you have tried a lot of. Um, um, the researchers in PEGS uh, pancreas. So uh, you might have already um, detected the feasibility and the safety of this procedure in pancreatic surgery. And as you mentioned that uh, you have already applied for the phase two, uh, phase one to phase two study in human PDAC patients. And it will probably uh, start uh, at the end of next year. Uh, are you interested in some um, uh, multi-center studies of this high flow procedure? I'm asking this because, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, I'm a surgeon in Shanghai Regional Hospital, and we exactly work on pancreatic cancer. And we have a very high volume of uh, patients. We perform uh, pancreatic surgery for more than 1,000 cases each year. So... <laughs> If you are interested in this uh, multi-center clinical study, maybe we can do some um, cooperations. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your for your comments. Um, uh, One thousand cases per year is uh, very very impressive uh, at my my scale. Um, uh, yes, of course, it, it's a. Uh, that would be great, uh, but uh, honestly, we are beginning with a phase one study because we have to prove that it is safe um, to, to ablate the neck of the pancreas around the mesenteric vessels uh, before uh, using a multicenter approach. Uh, we have to prove that it's, it's safe for patients uh, because if we have any complication, uh, with the superior mesenteric arteries that will be dramatic. So the, the first step, the first six patients uh, are for uh, proving the safety of the device. And just after that, we have um, a phase two evaluation with uh, several center in, uh, in the area. Um, several uh, hospital, um, university hospital uh, in Lyon, Clermont-Ferrand, and, uh, and, uh, and Saint Etienne. But it, honestly, if it works, I would be so happy <laughs> to have a collaboration with you. That would be great. And uh, if you want to discuss it uh, um, in uh, in the campus, uh, that would be that would be great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course, uh, I will definitely uh, send you email for the connection. And uh, as you mentioned that you are doing uh, now the first one to two study, it's mainly about the safety when you're treating with the SMA or SMV, am I correct? Yes. And have you think about to start from the, the tail, body and tail of the pancreas in order to uh, get rid of the impact of the vessels because it will be more safety. Um, uh, not in human be because if you have a, a, a small tumor, um, you it's difficult to propose to patient to perform IFU ablation rather than a surgery that is a gold standard. Uh, treatment uh, with curative intent. Um, so that one thing that could be done is that uh, as we well, as we made in the liver, that would be ablation of the tail of the pancreas just before resection. But um, uh, it's not so easy to to find some patients uh, who are who agree with that uh, strategy. Uh, so I'm not saying that we are only treating patients with, um, with the involvement of the SMA. 
Uh, and some patients with locally advanced pancreatic cancer have also celiac um, drug involvement, but uh, we do not plan to treat patients with uh, pancreas, uh, pancreatic cancer in the tail of the pancreas. Yeah, 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 I fully understand your point. What I mean to treat uh, with the patient uh, with the body and tail of the pancreas is uh, mainly in the population of uh, un unresectable, I mean, a more invasive uh, uh, stage of the pancreas cancer. Of course, you don't treat with them with high fuel for the resectable cases. Yeah, yeah, uh, it will open a very uh, wide range of topic for, for, for uh, I mean, uh, proposing by your uh, topic. So maybe we'll discuss afterwards. I'm uh, expecting to meet you. Thank mm. you. That would be great. Thank you very much. Questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Raise your hand or? No. Okay, no. Uh, shall we wait for 10 minutes? We will come back. Okay, thank you. Shall we begin now? Okay. Okay, let's begin. And the next speaker is Professor Hai Chen Chen. Professor Chen is the chairman and a professor in the Department of Thoracic Surgery at the Fudan University Shanghai Cancer Center. And he is also the director of the Institute of Thoracic Oncology and the Lung Cancer Center. Um, he has authored more than 190 SCI papers in academic journals, including cancer cells, JCO, and CCR. And also um, a lot of innovative findings in 17 of his uh, papers have been cited in 11 international guidelines of lung cancer, such as ASCO and ESMO, etc. And his topic today is individualized surgical treatment strategy for early stage lung cancer. Let's welcome. Uh, thank you, dear chairman. Um, it's my pleasure to be invited to uh, give a lecture here. My topic is individualized surgical treatment strategy for early stage not lung cancer, uh, we talk about the translation of knowledge. knowledge. Um, I have nothing to disclose for this topic. In the uh, uh, last 10 years, the spectrum of lung cancer is, is changing. Um, 10 years ago, uh, the NLT trial was reported in New England Journal of Medicine. They found that the low spiral CT can find more early stage lung cancer, and also can decrease the lung cancer mortality by 20%. What happened uh, in, in the, the uh, East Society? And 10 years ago, I con conducted a lung cancer screening in Shanghai from 2013 to 2014. We screening over 11,000 residents in the Minghang district. We found that 80% of that population was smoker and 60% of that population male. But surprisingly, we found and and 60% of lung cancer and it's uh, is narrow smoker and 66% of that that group lung cancer female. So that's the different scenario from the Western society. And uh, interestingly, we found that kind kind of lung cancer in this group. 70% of is the GGO legend. So uh, after that, we conduct another uh, lung cancer uh, screening uh, international or multi-center study. Uh, we've uh, collected six hospital employee data and also the Korean uh, in, uh, National Cancer, uh, National Medical Center from the hospital Canada. We found uh, and more uh, about 1% of uh, normal person found uh, turned out to be the lung cancer and around 2% of that population turned out to be the lung cancer. And uh, that's interesting, we found more young female and never smoker. And this is the rising uh, proportion in this group. And more interestingly, we found that uh, lung cancer lesion is 96% 90, of the lesion 
is the GGO legion and not the, the different scenario from the Western society. And uh, that uh, study we published in uh, JDCVS and also uh, the JDCVS invited uh, 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 published with uh, uh, four different uh, commentary and uh, some uh, uh, expertise suggest we should change uh, screening guideline uh, based on our, our data. And uh, that's where uh, our uh, research strategy I mean, how, uh, to do a, a, a spectrum of lung cancer study, including the lung cancer screening, optimization of pre-operative workup, and the personalized surgical strategy for this kind of digital lesion, early stage lung cancer, and also post-operative molecule classification of early stage lung cancer. That the whole scenario of, of our study. So first we found out not all the GGO uh, 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 is brand, uh, present in the, in the CT, but different in the uh, patholo uh, pathology. Maybe their inflammation, uh, avial hemorrhage, AP, uh, AP age, and also invasive adenocarcinoma. So we uh, classified the GGO lesion into uh, three uh, different uh, 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 type. The one is decreased uh, or disappeared in the following uh, follow up, maybe two weeks to six, several months. So the GGO lesion can disappear. That means that GGO uh, is the benign lesion. And uh, the second is no change. The, the GGO can be there for over one, several months until uh, two several months, even several decades, there are no change. And the third, in a, in a period of time, the uh, GGO can be enlarged, increased of the solid part. This uh, scenario, most of them it tell to be the lung cancer. So we can classify the, the GGO legion uh, uh, of lung nodule. Uh, the GGO legion sometime later, they, they can disappear or GGO legion disappeared, uh, decreased in density um, for the, then they can persist, uh, persist in for a long time. In some pure GGO, sometimes they, they, they enlarge and um, maybe they, they can enlarge to three to four centimeters. And some pure GGO, sometime later, they can become mixed GGO or even become solid GGO. And for some kind, uh, uh, kind of lung cancer, even in the very early stage, they can be a, a, a solid nodule and a solid nodule in, uh, enlarged. I think that the last uh, the group, maybe uh, uh, most of them found in the Western society. And also we found uh, this kind of uh, GGO legend before that the classic, classical uh, lung cancer. So how can we, uh, 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 this is the new, uh, uh, the question or new um, phenomenon we found in the uh, in the clinical practice. So, what, 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 how can we I precisely identify the GGO is lung cancer or is malignant? So, our working strategy uh, approaching to manage the low uh, um, low dose viral CT detected a small GGO legend. That uh, uh, algorithm we we published in the GDC last year. You know, first we, we found the GGO legend, we don't have to worry about it. And at least we follow four to six months. It was still there and um, a persistent for a long time and increasingly uh, very slowly. This kind of uh, GGO, uh, over 90% is, is, is uh, malignant. If sometime uh, several months later it appeared, uh, that GGO is benign. And so we uh, found the GGO legion uh, the child to be lung cancer. This kind of lung cancer is a special clinical type, subtype. And the no liver node metastasis is found in the GGO group. And the sub, uh, sub lower section is uh, sufficient for the GGO legion uh, lung cancer. And also, GGO featured lung adenocarcinoma is a special uh, clinical subtype. 
this story we published in the GTO in 2019. And also uh, in that uh, issue, the uh, editor uh, recommended, uh, the first recommended article in that issue. And after that, we can, we uh, result practically uh, uh, analysis uh, 2010 patient with completely uh, resected the pathology to state one in invasive non-small cell lung cancer. We found a pure GGO and five year survival rate, uh, RFF rate, hundred percent. If the meat mixed GGO uh, is down to the eighty seven percent, if solid GGO um, um, get uh, our, uh, we have the brand before um, around seventy percent. So it's the same at the stage one um, uh, invasive adenocarcinoma, but the different just because the different uh, the CT is the printed, uh, experience, so we can. Uh, predict their uh, prognosis. And also we found that the distinct prognostic factor, the adenocarcinoma subtype don't have the prognostic value in the subsolid group. And it had in the part sol in, in the part solid group. And VPI they didn't have the, the prognosis value in part solid group, but it, it had in the solid group. And also we, uh, we can uh, 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 further divide the, the mixed GGO into two uh, groups, uh, heterogeneous GGO and a real, part, uh, real part solid GGO. And, and HGO and solid component appeared in, only in the long window and not in the mediastinal window. And the real part solid GGO and the solid component appeared in both long and immediate steiner window. And the pure GGO, um, we, we found uh, uh, the, the five years IFS 100%, and also we found HGGO the same. So we uh, defined pure GGO it radiologically uh, adding the customer in cyto and HGGO in the radiologically minimally invasive adding carcinoma. The post-operative survival for the HGGO is similar uh, with the pure GGO, five years over survival RF rate is 100%. And also we found if the, uh, the GGO greater than three centimeters, and if after the, the adjustment of the component, the com solid component side, the GGO, still have the price no take value. That means if the, uh, the legion uh, have the uh, GGO component, that means that that legion have very good, is the uh, good uh, favorable price no take value. But if the, uh, the lymph node is positive, so the price no, uh, price no take effect of GGO is, uh, have nothing. That means if the lymph node uh, positive, uh, the, the lesion have the GGO lesion or not, it doesn't matter. And also we found the CD density is not associated with the pathological tumor invasion for the pure GGO and also CT tie size was the only radiological parameter associated with tumor invasion. That means uh, no matter the, the CD density, not, uh, it doesn't predict the the uh, tumor invasion. So uh, last uh, five year, we uh, uh, published about uh, around the uh, around the thirty uh, uh, English literature in the national in international mainstream journal. So last year, uh, the, uh, the the American Association for so um, American Association for Thoracic Surgeon uh, uh, American Society for Thoracic Surgeon the uh, official uh, journal, Annals of Surgery, Surgery, invited me to write, uh, uh, invited her to be review for the uh, management of ground grassy obesity in the lung cancer spectrum. So the, uh, the, the review, uh, we, we can find the GGO feature lung adenal customer is indolent and a wide surgical intervention window and a low frequency of lymph nodes distant metastasis and a subloper resection is sufficient for this kind of lesion. 
So what's this, uh, we, we talking about the startup uh, uh, state of art concept of minimum invasive surgery. Um, for um, that's what we are talking about minimum invasive surgery. You know, the first we do post lateral uh, uh, sarcotomy and the muscle sparing sarcotomy and a four port vest, two port vest, three port vest. And what's the ultimate is the uniport vest. What we are talking about minimally invasive surgery, that means uh, mostly talking about minimal incisional surgery. That means the minimal invasive only means the, the, the incision, not in the, in the inside. And uh, you know, there's an argue between the surgeon and the radiation oncologist. So the radiation oncologist say, you can see, you can see we can cure the patient without you know, any uh, incision uh, damage. So we have, uh, you talking about the minimum invasive, we talking about the no invasive because the, the skin is intact. Um, you know, uh, that been making me to think about it. So the minimum invasive surgery, not, not just minimal incisional surgery. So uh, in the 2018, we published a paper in the annual surgery, uh, the, the uh, surgical prospective we propose a uh, uh, minimal invasive surgery 3.0. That means minimal incision, minimal uh, resection, and uh, that's organ level, and also the systemic level, that minimal systemic damage. Uh, we don't, uh, the incision uh, damage um, uh, as, as small as possible. And our, our ultimate goal to make our patient live longer and live better. Just don't just don't compare the incision, the size of the incision. So according to our uh, the concept, so we uh, do an individual uh, strategy for early stage lung cancer. You know, uh, we do uh, the, uh, the the solid uh, solid nodule. We do the preoperative workup and surgical procedure standards based on the solid lesion. When we uh, uh, operate on the, uh, the GGO legion, I, I, I don't think we need to the, do the same preoperative workup and, uh, and a surgical procedure. So we uh, do a, a prospective, a retrospective and a prospective uh, 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 study to uh, 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 minimize the preoperative uh, uh, workup. So uh, we, we, we found that this kind of patient, we don't have to uh, uh, bronchoscopy, we don't have to do a uh, uh, bone scan, and also we don't, don't have to, to do uh, MRI. And for the lymph node dissection, and uh, in the 2012, we uh, we established a nomogram to predict uh, the uh, lymph node uh, possibility of uh, lymph node positive, but we cannot this nomogram cannot predict the N zero status. So uh, the next year we found you know some kind of uh, um, early stage lung cancer. They don't have uh, median. Uh, don't have a mediastinal lymph node dissection. That means for this group, the patient, we don't have to do a mediastinal lymph node dissection. Uh, so we, uh, from 2011, we uh, make a proposal uh, for uh, further, guide, further section, uh, third uh, di um, pathological diagnosis guided, guided the uh, surgical uh, strategy. We, we, we do a wedge and then we, the, we send a sample to the frozen section. If they uh, find an AH, AIS, MIA, we just do the uh, sub-low bar section. We don't have to do media spinal lymph node dissection. If it's in invasive adenocarcinoma, we do this, the traditional uh, lobectomy plus lymph node dissection. And we found, uh, uh, use this strategy and uh, most uh, 50% of the early stage lung cancer, we can do a uh, uh, sublobar section. And then that uh, full section and the final uh, pathological diagnosis accurate rate is 96%. 90, 
So this uh, story we published in the JCO in 2013. And uh, the JCO also uh, um, published along with the editorial additional step towards personalization of surgical care for early stage non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, in 2017, is the um, recommended by the ISMO guideline. And also the uh, strategy can guide the lymph node dissection. That means if the for patient with LPA, extent of lymph node dissection was not associated with OS or RFS, that means for this kind of patient, we don't have to do a mediastinal lymph node dissection. That means we can cut at, at, as small as a small proportion of the lung, and also we can uh, vive the medium, medium uh, lymph node dissection. That's the, the, the true minimal invasive surgery. And the last year we found that we retrospectively analyzed almost 3,000 patients with invasive lung, uh, small cell lung cancer. We found none of the CTR less than 0.5 legion with the lymph node uh, metastasis. None of the tumor located in apical segment had inferior mediastinal lymph node dissection. That we got the, for some patient, we don't have to do mediastinal lymph nodes. For some patient, we can do a selected medias, uh, mediastinal lymph node dissection. So uh, that's the individualized uh, lymph node uh, dissection strategy. And for according to what we found uh, uh, before, we now we do a, a two uh, protect, uh, protect, uh, prospective and, and the two trial. The one trial is a uh, observed study, another trial is the randomized uh, study. You know, the first trial almost done t this year, and another trial, I think it will, be, will have a, a finished recruiting patient in two years. And also, we uh, uh, found uh, in uh, individualized post operative civilian program that we published in the 2018 in the chest, uh, that's according to the retrospective uh, patient now, or almost 3,000 patients. That means we can uh, ask your patient, uh, you um, come to follow up and uh, to, especially for the specific organ, then we uh, uh, make the individual civilians. So we can see uh, uh, the uh, CDs detect the region, we can divide it into uh, mass or nodule, solid nodule or GGO nodule, mixed or, or pure. And uh, we, uh, from the different legion, we, we can, uh, we, we know the patient have a different prognosis. So we just uh, think about it, that the uh, uh, GGO uh, lung cancer, uh, the, uh, you know, before the we, lung cancer screening, we found stage one, two, three, four, uh, a different um, uh, stage of lung cancer. And the surgery can involve the at in a uh, at shot. Uh, if if the uh, staging goes up, and the prognosis and the prognosis is as worse as worse as the uh, staging goes up, and the uh, aut optimal time is stage one. Even with one st uh, stage one patient, in the five year survival rate is not ideal. It eighty around 80 to 90 percent. And now uh, from the lung cancer screening, we can find before invasive surgery and uh, uh, before the, uh, the preoperative workup and surgery and follow-up, it, it's very simple. But now we just uh, to uh, uh, put emphasis how to avoid, how to avoid uh, over treatment or over diagnosis. Uh, then we, we published a paper this year that uh, uh, it could review. I proposed uh, three uh, as strategies to uh, avoid the over treatment or uh, diagnosis. The, the first, avoid the benign disease as a malignancy. That means the malignant, uh, the benign rate less than 10%. To avoid the early stage lung cancer at the advanced stage patient, that means GGO laden, the very early stage, we, we don't have to treat the patient at advanced stage. That means the surgery is very simple. 
And uh, three, avoid the treat indolent malignancy as aggressive malignancy. That means the uh, gigital agent we have uh, would widen the surgery treatment window. We don't have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to treat the patient uh, in a in a harsh way, and uh, the time proper timing and uh, for the the young patient, the surgery don't uh, uh, um, affect their their life chain uh, uh, life path or the career their career uh, advancement. So uh, we consider what all diagnosis and the world treatment. You know, before uh, we 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 treated the solid lesion. We use the, the traditional uh, before a parallel to work on surgery. And uh, if we treat the, the GGO lesion at the same as, as traditional one, I think that the old diagnosis or treatment. But if we treat it, you know, what we found a very simple way that the, the, the change in our uh, clinical practice that make our patient uh, live longer and live better. So we uh, use our strategy for our patient. We can see we published our uh, our data. We have a very bad, uh, very 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 uh, good uh, prognosis. Our uh, five year post operative survival rate in our center is is the best in. Uh, 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 I think it uh, compared to ICLC, we are we are we are about ten percent uh, better. And also uh, in the last 10 years, we have uh, 17 articles was cited uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 21 time cited by uh, now as the 13 international lung cancer guideline or consensus. And also uh, in the past five years, we have, uh, um, I have invited to write a commentary or, edit or editorial. And uh, what we have in 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 our uh, center, and all side, all side China, we we are the back, we are the number one in uh, in terms of volume, uh, all the world. Last year we have uh, about the three uh, uh, three thousand six hundred lung cancer, and uh, uh, eighty seven eighty seven percent it's stage stage one. And the percentage of benign legend in the patient resecting uh, surgical legend is eight uh, percent. Uh, and last year we uh, we do esophageal cancer, uh, esophagectomy over eight hundred. So our ongoing project is uh, the how to uh, we can find from age, AIS, MIA, and uh, from stage one. Uh, to stage three, uh, stage three, stage four. We cannot find a patient uh, in, the, in the single patient, but we, we can find a lot of the patient in the different stage. So we try to know the key molecule event and the etiology of uh, why the patient, the, the young, never, fem never smoke and the female have lung cancer. And also we want to, try to, want to know the the different type, uh, the, the lung cancer, their immune uh, micro involvement. We are here to uh, looking forward the collaboration uh, between uh, the uh, our uh, institution and uh, our our friend. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And actually, GGO is now a really a serious problem. Uh, and a lot of people just worry about it. And Professor Chen just show us the way out, just uh, tell us how to sort it out. And we have been very much impressive with your contribution to the guidelines uh, for the international guidelines. So uh, thanks again for your uh, wonderful work and also your fantastic presentation. And shall we just leave all the questions to the discussion part? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And next presenter is Professor Andrew Batoli. And uh, he is the professor of computer vision and computer assisted surgery. Um, his main research interests are in the computer vision, including image 
registration and shape from X for rigid and deformable environments and their application to computer aid medical interventions. And his topic today is hmm, laparoscopic augmented reality from preoperative image data. Let's welcome. Hello. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Should we uh, begin now? Can we just start now? Should we begin? Is it my turn? Okay, thank you. Is it my turn? Yes, yes, yours, please. Would you right. share your yeah. screen with us? Yes. Share your screen. Yeah, just give me a second. I'm okay. activating the sharing. Mm. So you should be able to see oh, my good. screen. Yes. Yes, it's good. All right. Thanks. So uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Adrian Bartoli from uh, the University of Clermont-Ferrand in France. And uh, this morning I'm speaking about laparoscopic augmented reality from uh, preoperative image data to treat uh, different forms of uh, pathologies, including uh, cancer uh, in interventions. So that will be the uh, content of my presentation. Uh, I'll first discuss laparoscopy and augmented laparoscopy, then uh, talk about the application specifically for the liver. And thirdly, the problem of uh, validating, then the extension to uterus, kidney, and, and uh, plan for uh, future work. So laparoscopy, as you're probably all aware of, is a form of endoscopic surgery in, in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So it, it's done with the uh, use of a uh, camera, which is outside the patient, but connected to a fiber optics, which allows the surgeon to see the inside of the cavity on a screen or multiple screens in the uh, operating theater in real time. And so one of the major limits of laparoscopy is the ability to, to locate the internal structures of the organs. So if you look at these two images, there's a uterus on the left and a liver on the right. And um, these two organs, they contain tumor. We know they contain tumor because of the uh, preoperative uh, images like uh, MRI and, and CT. But during surgery, we don't know exactly where these uh, tumors are. So that makes the intervention complex and, and delicate. And therefore we think that uh, one of the main challenges in laparoscopy is to uh, improve visualization. And um, of course, during laparoscopy, the surgeon has seen the uh, preoperative CT scan or MRI. Um, so they know where the tumors are approximately but it's mentally extremely difficult to bring this information back from the, the scan onto the uh, operative field directly. So what we're proposing here is an approach that we call augmented laparoscopy, where we take the information from the CT and use a computer program to fuse this information with a live endoscopic image during surgery. So that's what you can see on the, on the right schematic. Uh, you can see here in blue a uh, vessel tree and in yellow two tumors for the for this liver which were superimposed by the machine onto the image in real time during uh, during the surgery so technically this is a complex problem we have to solve this uh, this equation or on on the one hand we have the pre-op ct with all the information we need then during surgery we have a laparoscopy image this one and we want to fuse the two to obtain the, the image. We're interested in the one you can see on the, on the right, on the right hand, 
and so on. So the difficulty technically is that's two different modalities, CT and optical. There are no fixed structures like bones, uh, and, and it's difficult because the organs move, they form, and especially they change shape between the time the preoperative CT was acquired and the time of surgery. So I'll discuss first the, the case of how we can solve this for the liver. Uh, so on, on the top, you have this equation we have to resolve. And um, on the bottom, I'm going to construct the different steps of the technical solution. So you have the preoperative state of the organ on the left and the intraoperative state on the right. So we know that we have a camera, which is the endoscope, which has filmed this, uh, this image. And we have a mathematical model of this camera uh, that we can calibrate using uh, different techniques. So now that we have this camera model, we look for a uh, deformation field in 3D. So this deformation field, you can imagine this as uh, we take the space around the, the liver, the liver in the, in the city, and in the space, we, uh, we actually subdivide the space into mini cells, a lot of mini cells, we call voxels. And for each of these mini cells of space, we search for the displacement that will bring these little parts of the city in the right position in the coordinates of the uh, endoscopic camera. So that's a, that's a very difficult uh, mathematical problem. And we, we have found a solution that is based on the visible surface, analyzing the visible surface of the organ first to compute this deformation field. And once we have this displacement for the visible surface, we somehow extrapolate it to the inside of the organ. And with this, we're able to transfer the, the inner structures of the organ from the CT uh, to the intraoperative image. So in order to compute these deformation fields, we use different uh, uh, cues from the images. So we use uh, first biomechanics to deform the organ properly. Anatomical landmarks we can define, which are common to the uh, preoperative CT and to the intraoperative image. Uh, typically on the liver, that would be the, the round ligaments uh, because it's visible in both modalities and, and anatomical places like um, the lower ridge, etc. And finally, we have visual cues, which are a bit similar to what we as human use to perceive depth when we look uh, at something. So I'm, I'm going to briefly illustrate this with, uh, with a real, uh, real case where um, uh, we had a segmentectomy with endophytic tumors, which were very well visible on the CT, uh, as you can see here in the bottom left. Um, but it was really difficult uh, during surgery to see where they were exactly uh, on the organ. So we did this um, step of registration of the preoperative uh, information onto the laparoscopy image. You can see this on the, on the video. So the model is gradually deforming so that um, the steps that we take to deform, to, to compute this deformation field in 3D, to make the two images in the same coordinate frames, I'm going to show it again, if I can, yes, I should start again. So you can see this model constructed from the CT deforming little by little and fitting the images as it deforms. So with this, you can see we're, we're predict, predicting the main vessels and, and the two tumors in yellow uh, in, in the position of the intraoperative uh, view of the, the surgeon. So in this particular case, you can see on the bottom left, the surgeon with the two standard laparoscopy screens, the intraoperative ultrasound screen in the middle, and on the left, the, the screen of her uh, augmented laparoscopy prototype. And that's in the middle, you can see the um, typical images we have with the organ and the uh, superimposed structures. So we did a couple of uh, augmentations in this surgery because the surgeon wanted to check these uh, resections uh, lines. So you can see in the bottom image, he started to cut initially a piece of the liver. And uh, he realized that wasn't large enough to fully include the, the tumor, one of the tumors. And the postoperative histology uh, confirmed that indeed the first piece he resected was actually too small because the margin was just one millimeter, whereas it should be closer to a centimeter 
uh, for a safe uh, resection margin. Um, we have a software, so we have a team of engineers and researchers who implemented this, uh, this principle, have turned you into a working computational platform. So our platform is called Hepatox. You can see a screenshot of this software on the, on the right of the screen. And uh, there are different modalities for the uh, surgeon to interact with the software to customize the, um, this registration of the model onto the image. So of course, this is useful if it works well, which means it must be uh, having an impact on the, um, on the clinical outcome. And also, uh, it must be precise. So it means the accuracy of the prediction of the tumor must be good. Because if we tell the surgeon that the tumor is there and it's actually a centimeter away, that's, uh, that's not useful and that's even uh, harmful. So we have developed several models for validating our, our augmented reality, and this covers digital models that we make by computer simulations up to uh, clinical models that we develop with patients. Of course, um, there's a compromise. So the digital models, they are quite weak in terms of realism, but they're uh, simple in terms of implementation because when we simulate something, we know everything about what, what we've simulated. So in particular, if we simulate tumors, we know exactly where we simulated them. So we have access to some for, form of ground truth and we can compare augmented reality to ground truth. On the clinical model, we have the opposite trend, of course. Uh, they are strongly realistic, but their implementation is complex because by definition, we don't know where the tumors are. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't need augmented reality. Um, so we have done an evaluation. The latest one we've done is um, with laparoscopic ultrasound. And uh, this project was partly supported by uh, the cancer of Paul Clara in Lyon, uh, where we actually use the intraoperative ultrasound to acquire some sort of ground truth on the tumor. So as you can see in, in the top image here, you have the laparoscopic ultrasound probe with markers that we glued onto this Probe. So this is watched by the endoscope here. And thanks to this, um, these markers on the image, we're able to precisely locate the position of the probe uh, with respect to the camera. Uh, with this, we're able to uh, know where the image is, uh, the, the endoscopic, the, lap, the um, echographic image is uh, here. And with this, if we segment the tumor in the uh, US image, we're able to know exactly where the tumor is. Um, so this is some form of augmented reality, and we can compare our augmented reality without ultrasound to the um, ground truth given by the ultrasound. So we have quantitative evaluation. So uh, this is the, the results we obtained for the existing methods, the uh, target registration error, which is somehow a good measure of precision, is about uh, two centimeters, which is a bit too large for the, uh, the precision we, we're targeting, which should be closer to a, a, a centimeter. Uh, for the uh, uterus, this is um, an earlier work that we started. So we did this before, uh, liver, so that's more or less the same, uh, same problem. The uterus behaves differently, and in this case, we're able to not just augment individual images, but full video uh, live during surgery. So here, you can see a moving uterus, and uh, there are two tumors, uh, one augmented in green and one augmented in blue, and um, this is fully automatic, so there is a a bit of interaction from the surgeon at the beginning at the setup time of the augmented reality, but then this is fully automatic. And uh, you can see our, our surgeon here doing surgery um, with the regular laparoscopy screen on the right and the augmented laparoscopy screen on the left. You can see the tumor is augmented here. So in this surgery, the surgeon knows exactly where to incise the organ to find a tumor. Um, another example with the uterus, where you can see here the, the, the full cavity, uterine cavity in black and two tumors in, uh, in yellow, augmented in real time during surgery. So that, that's simpler to do on the uterus than on the liver because the uterus is mostly rigid during surgery. And 
nonetheless, our objective is to do exactly this on the liver, which is more complex because of the heavy deformation it undergoes during surgery. Um, that's another example in gynecology where um, an adenomyoma was uh, meant to be removed. And this is a small tumor, which is uh, typically very hard to, to find. And uh, in this example, we were very happy because the uh, surgeon opened the, the cavity and, and the, the uterus and found the, the tumor almost, uh, almost directly. Yes, that was there as, as predicted by uh, augmented reality. And uh, I'm going to skip these two examples. So that was showing the uh, muscular muscle fibers from diffusion MRI uh, directly in surgery, as you can see here. And I want to show this last video on the kidney. So this is a robotic uh, surgery. You can see the kidney here on the left. And we have uh, augmented the pedicle and the tumor. And you can see here the augmentation, allowing the surgeon to see really what's inside for this uh, endophytic tumor during the, the surgery. So as for the ureterus, the kidney is fairly more rigid than the liver. So it allows us to do this uh, real-time tracking automatically of the organ during surgery and do this real-time uh, augmented reality. It's not perfect. You can see that it's coming on and off. There is a bit of jitter, but we're working hard on uh, on improving this uh, this um, thing for the uh, for the kidney. Uh, the main difficulty with the kidney is the renal fat which surrounds it, um, and and which means we cannot see it very well in all cases. And uh, so for future work, we're planning on validating clinically. Uh, all this with more patients, so to include more patients, having more realistic validation models. We also want to expand to more organs and more pathologies, um, bring, bring these to the patient's uh, bedsides and, and to real surgery by industrializing. And of course, we have lots of new ideas of how we could uh, help the surgeons uh, with this means of augmenting the image in real time. Um, so I'm happy to handle any questions you may have or discuss offline if you're interested in, in this work. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. It's like a brainstorm. <laughs> and actually to develop such uh, software, uh, we might need a lot of collaboration between the clinicians uh, software uh, engineers or uh, and some uh, I suppose uh, is a vision um, scientists so it's really hard but I think it is of great clinical uh, value so it's really very interesting so thank you, thank you. thanks again and thank you any, any questions and any comments we have time to have a couple of questions You if can I may, raise your hand. I have a, a question for Professor Bartoli. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, I'm a former colleague of uh, Emmanuel Huck and uh, Bertrand Leroy, so I followed this this work because it's uh, very very interesting in the in the management of uh, of patient with liver tumor because uh, clearly. The liver surgery is a 3D surgery. And when we are performing uh, laparoscopic resection, liver resection, it's very hard to find uh, the proper uh, transaction line. And uh, your tool is, is very, very helpful. And I hope that uh, that will be a, a great experience. Um, just to, to understand, uh, here you have a, a, a projection of the tumor, but it's a 2D, 2D projection. It's not a 3D projection with uh, special glasses or whatever. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Can can you still see my screen? Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to show one of the the slides to help me uh, explain. So. Yeah, I think this this should this should help. Um, that's that's uh, that's a two D visualization indeed because we are showing the tumor in the two D image we have from the from the laparoscope. So in this respect, this is three D. But when we compute this three uh, D deformation field, you can see on the screen, we bring the tumor from the CT to the to the camera coordinates. So the tumor, we, we bring it to some 3D coordinates and then we project it to the image afterwards. And uh, you're right to underline that this is a 2D visualization because, because it is, but uh, we have planned to try this on the robots and um, to do a full 3D visualization. I think we're, we're getting close to that and uh, this will improve a lot the visualization. So totally true. And uh, I have uh, another question. Thank you for your response. Uh, what is uh, the main difficulty you have right now with the liver? Uh, I understood you you made the three D projection of the liver with uh, recalibration, and you can't follow the deformation uh, of the liver. Is that correct? So you have an instant picture of the, the liver and the tumor. And if you move the liver, you lose it. Is, is, is that correct? And is that your exactly. difficulty? Yeah, that's very correct. Uh, we can augment uh, still images, but if the liver moves and deforms, then uh, the registration is lost. And we don't have a tracking process working yet. Uh, we're working on it. And uh, hopefully in, in the next uh, month, years, we're able to track the liver in, in real time as we've done for the, for the uterus or the, or the kidney. But uh, the main difficulty is the defamation, yeah. And uh, uh, have you made some, uh, uh, observed some differences uh, between a, a smooth liver and a fibrotic liver, which is very, very hard, so they're, less deformation was it helpful or or not mm. no i think i think it was it will be as difficult i think as soon as there are deformations it's 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 difficult even though they can be uh, small or wide uh, it, it's it's difficult in any case okay thank you very much and uh, thank you really great work Thank you. Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, I also want to join this discussion because I'm also very interested in this uh, artificial reconstruction of the, of the uh, liver tumor. And uh, as uh, with respect to also being a surgeon, I'm a little uh, interested in uh, the, the procedure, how you perform during the surgery, because uh, uh, what I see at the beginning is that uh, you are trying to do the 3D reconstruction of the tumor while in the laparoscopy and uh, uh, and the next picture, uh, sorry, uh, it's, it's the following picture somewhere else, it doesn't matter. You also include the uh, intraoperative uh, ultrasound to confirm the localization of the tumor. So my question is, if you uh, include the ultra intraoperative ultrasound with your with this uh, very uh, sexy uh, reconstruction technique, and uh, what's the purpose of your reconstruction? I mean, anyway, you need to do, you you need an intraoperative ultrasound. No, you, we don't. You we don't need it, strictly speaking, um, that's a very good question. Um, I think I, I went very fast on this part. Uh, we used uh, intraoperative ultrasound for validation only because this is the gold standard, right, in surgery. So we thought mm -hmm. that if we could actually co-register the measurement we make with the intraoperative ultrasound to the augmented reality that we've done, um, this would bring us a way to compare 
our method against the gold standard. Uh, so we've used the intraoperative ultrasound to say, okay, that's where the tumor is to measure the position of the tumor quantitatively in the coordinates of the of the camera. And and once we had this, we could compare uh, directly with the with the augmented reality. Perhaps I can bring the um, the slide back. So this one. So here we actually have a mathematical model, a virtual model, where we have the laparoscopic ultrasound tumor profile that we have segmented into the uh, uh, the US image that we have expressed in the same coordinate frame in 3D as the, the, the tumor that we predict. Here, there's this solid uh, object here that we predict from the CT uh, with augmented reality. And so we're able to compute some sort of distance between these two predictions. And we use the LUS as the reference, as the truth. Okay. And then that will come to another question. And uh, how long does it take during the surgery to um, overlapping the, the reconstructed image with the, 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 the real liver? Um, overall, it's about a minute. Okay. Yeah, as you showed at the beginning of your topic, it's a, like a, a remodeling the, the, the 3D structure to, to overlap with the liver, the, the, the yes. shape, right? Okay, yes. okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I asked this question because, uh, you, you know, to the surgeons, we are always um, uh, very uh, pushing in the surgery to, to uh, minimize the time of the surgery. So if it, it takes a huge long time and we would rather choose the ultrasound. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course, that's a, that's a perfectly natural question. So uh, usability is very important and we, we're working on uh, making it uh, actually uh, faster. And uh, we've made great, uh, great progress, which we haven't tested yet uh, in the operating theater. But um, eventually, I think we can bring it down to a uh, couple of seconds. Mm -mm -mm. And can you also do measurements during the surgery? I mean, you show the picture and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, like projection. And if you can do some measurements like the, like the ultrasound, then you can measure how, how deep it is from the surface. And I, I think it's just a mathematic and it's, a, it's feasible, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. You're right. That's uh, that's a simple thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Okay. okay no more questions. So, uh, in this section, um, four talented uh, professors have shared their wonderful presentations, and we have learned a lot. Also, all of us have had a good time, but it's really a shame that due to the limitation of the time, we have to say goodbye. Hopefully, next year we can meet face to face. Okay, see you. Thank bye. you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>